We're delving back into the wide world of IEMs. As I've said at every opportunity, IEMs are released so frequently from so many different manufacturers that it's a mind-bending experience to navigate through all the viable options. Today, we're going to talk about a manufacturer whose products I have not before used. A seller on AliExpress reached out to me and asked if I would review one of the products they sell. We negotiated a price. I bring you the WGT2 Tesla Magnetic Bass Hi-Fi Music Monitor Studio Stereo MMCX Metal Earphone. Uh, this rolls off the tongue like molasses dipped in honey. The T2 retails for between $237 and $250. Let's take a look at this Tesla driver IEM. First and foremost, WG promises that the T2 uses Tesla magnetic drivers. They claim this will reproduce loud treble and strong bass at any time. They say that the T2 will reflect subtle musical differences. There's a lot of marketing lingo to wade through. WG says that the T2 will present smooth sound, high resolution, and a wide sound field. They claim all of this will result in a performance similar to that of speakers. Surprisingly, WG does provide a frequency response graph with comparisons against a few other IEMs. I cannot speak to the efficacy of the measurements, but it's nice to have something to look at. The T2's graph suggests a lazy U-shaped signature with a significant upward deviation that is outside the 20 kHz range. The T2 is built of aluminum. It comes in green, black, and pink options. The T2's shell is assembled in two halves. You can see the seam running the circumference of the housing. However, the T2 is smooth to the touch. There are wavy indents on the outer shell. These are a design I have not before run into with any other IEMs in my collection. The T2 comes with six sets of silicone ear tips. These seem to be of good construction. You also get an MMCX cable which terminates in 3.5mm. Finally, there's a leather pouch for holding all these accessories. The cable is among the nicest I have ever seen. It is pliable, soft, tough, but transmits little microphonics. The leather pouch is, well, less than stellar. It's large enough to hold everything, but seems to be made of low-quality leather. As for comfort, I was rather surprised by the fit. The T2 sits flush in my ears and the ear tips are comfortable for long periods. No amount of vigorous head shaking dislodged this IEM. I can easily wear the T2 for about 3 hours before needing a break. Overall, the T2 is well made. The cable is quite nice, the ear tips are perfectly acceptable, and the leather bag is, well, serviceable. We have seen a greater set of accessories at cheaper price points, but we have also seen far less at much higher prices. Death on Ray, Tender, anyone? To test the T2, I used it with my Low 2 Paw S1, Low 2 Paw 6000, Eco Zerta ITM03, and the RME ADI2 DAC. I used the stock accessories. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Cobus. The T2 is 35 ohms with a sensitivity of 110 decibels. You can plug these directly into a mobile device if it still has an audio jack. A modest amp like the one found in the Zerda will provide plenty of power. I use the narrow bore ear tips. The wider bore ear tips seem to reduce space but tend to add a little bit more clarity. WG says that the T2 has strong bass. My tests indicate this IEM has fairly neutral sub bass but an emphasized mid bass. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, there's a rumble from the start of the song. This builds into a crescendo. The T2 presented this detail. The transients, however, was fast. The neutral moon drop corks, for example, had longer reverberation and slightly louder rumble. When the crescendo hit, the organ cut through the other instruments on the T2. The rolling thunder effect was audible but did not overpower the other elements. When the vocals chimed in, they rose from the background until they were about shoulder to shoulder with the instruments. In Conquer by Overwork, there's a rolling marble sound at the beginning. This is supposed to pan from right to left to center. The T2 did present the sound of rolling marbles and the panning. There are multiple drums in this track and the T2 clearly rendered all of them. Their impacts were a little harder, a little sharper than what I heard on the corks. There was less melding among drum strikes on the T2 than on the corks. I listened to several hip-hop songs including Pure Water, New Patek, Reel It In, and Uproar. On each occasion, the T2 did present the sub bass clearly. The subwoofer sounded like it was at the other end of a medium-sized room. The drums were louder than the subwoofer. 
The quarks appear to marginally be louder in the sub-bass comparatively to the T2. Vocals were two steps ahead of the instruments on the T2. Now listen to my Sicario playlist. I use these songs to listen for any audible bass distortion. Traversing from low to high volumes, I did not hear any distortion. Overall, the T2 seems to have fairly neutral sub-bass and a marginally elevated mid-bass. There's good separation between sub-bass and mid-bass and slightly faster transients compared to the neutral Moondrop quarks. My tests indicate that the T2 has forward mids and slightly sibilant vocals. In Orla Gartland's song, Why Am I Like This?, there's natural vocal grain and sibilance mixed in. The T2 presented the grain without emphasizing it. However, it did slightly emphasize the vocal sibilance. Compared to the quarks, the sibilance was a few decibels louder on the T2. Orla's voice was two steps ahead of the instruments. There was minimal melding between the drums and the guitar. In Want You Back by Haim, the T2 again slightly emphasized female vocal sibilance. It was a few decibels louder than what I heard on the quarks. At 8 seconds, the primary singer says the word we and drags it out, making it sound gravelly. The T2 clearly rendered this detail. There are two backup vocalists, one in either channel. The T2 clearly presented all three voices. When the instruments played at maximum, I could hear all three voices, but I did have to concentrate. The drums, piano, bass, and guitar barely melded their notes among each other. In Superposition by Young the Giant, the T2 rendered the ukulele, drums, and bass without making any instrument sound louder than any other. All were clear. The primary male vocalist was two steps ahead of the instruments. His vocal sibilance was ever so slightly emphasized, just a hint louder than what I heard on the quarks. There's a backup vocalist in this track, his voice layered beneath the primaries. Most IEMs and headphones cannot reveal this detail. The T2 did barely separate the voices, however. Between 1 minute and 10 and 1 minute and 20 seconds, there are sharp intakes of breaths. The T2 presented this detail clearly. Overall, the mids are forward with vocals standing apart from instruments. Both male and female vocalists receive a marginal emphasis in sibilance. I suspect you could EQ this to a flatter presentation if you wanted. There's above average clarity in the mids region. WG says that the T2 will have loud treble. My tests indicate that the T2 has a slight upper treble emphasis. In Skirtso for X-Wings, the T2 clearly presented the brass and horns. Their nasally signatures cut through the other instruments. However, the higher pitched notes were a little bit louder than what I heard on the neutral quarks. There was good separation among all the group sets. The timpani was audible, but did not sound louder than the other elements. The T2 appears to have width and depth, but no verticality. In other words, sounds appeared further or closer into the wings, or layered front and back like in an orchestra arrangement. No sounds came from above or below. In Flight from the City, the T2 made the piano sound like it was about 6 feet away. The bassy notes had fast transients faster than what I heard on the quarks. I could hear the pops and sizzles and electric buzzing effects. The creaking of wood on the penis bitch and the shifting of the cello's weight were easily audible. The cello barely melded with the piano. In Take 5 by the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the T2 rendered the piano in the right, drums in the left, saxophone center, and the bass a step behind. The cymbals were slightly louder than the piano, but the saxophone was loudest of all. The higher pitched notes were a little emphasized compared to the quarks. The cymbals were struck at different positions, which should result in varying tonalities. The T2 did present this detail. Overall, the T2 seems to have a slight upper treble emphasis. There is good clarity in this region. Even at high volumes, nothing sounded harsh or piercing. WG says that the T2 will let you hear these subtle details in music. Having listened to this IEM for extended periods over the last month, I can essentially confirm that statement. I think the T2 does present details clearly. While nothing like the HD 800S, Focal Clear, or the Austrian Audio headphones, the T2 has no trouble rendering obvious and subtle details. More nuanced, minute details might not be easily heard. Twangs of guitar strings, multiple vocalists, sharp intakes of breaths, creaking of wood, shifting of a cello's weight, pops and sizzles, electric buzzing, gravelly natures of vocals, differing tonalities of cymbal strikes, all of these kinds of details are available through the T2. I have a quantitative test for detail retrieval. I use Kazuki's song New Light, which has layers of details. This includes the sound of wind, rustling of grass, children playing, synth, piano, and footsteps. I count the number of footsteps I can hear in the first 60 seconds. 
The Heidi's MS2 presents 8 to 9 footsteps. The Tin Hi-Fi T2 and T2 Evo present 7 to 8. The Moondrop Aria presents 7. The T2 Plus, Blonde BL05, and The Audio Legacy 2 present 6 to 7 footsteps. The Moondrop Starfield presents 6. The Moondrop Quarks, Blonde BL03, and Triple Wind Melee each present 5 to 6. The WGT2 presented 9 to 10 footsteps. For my detailed resolution scale, I use the Moondrop Aria and Starfield as the average performers. Any IEM that provides more or less footsteps is judged accordingly. Thus, on my scale, the BL03 would be considered below average and the Tin Hi-Fi T2 would be above average. Using this standard, it seems clear to me that the WGT2 has above average detail retrieval. In fact, using the new light test, the WGT2 has now surpassed every other IEM HiF tested. It presents the greatest number of footsteps within this limited test scenario. Of course, changing ear tips or applying EQ might alter your experience. WG says that the T2 has a wide sound field. My month-long experience with the T2 leads me to conclude that, yes, this IEM seems to have wide soundstage. Placing instruments and vocalists is not particularly difficult for this IEM. It has depth and width. Elements can sound further or closer, depending on the recording. The T2 also has above average clarity and faster than typical transients when compared to dynamic drivers in general. This is not the same speed of transients as with planar drivers, however. Just as with the detail resolution test, I also have a scale for soundstage. For me, this involves, yet again, using the Moondrop Aria and Starfield as the average performers. Anything that has greater or lesser soundstage is judged accordingly. The Tin Hi-Fi T2 and Heidi's MS2 have above average soundstage. The Blonde BL03, the BL05S are average at best and perhaps slightly below average in soundstage based upon proper fit. The Starfield, Aria, and Quarks are average. I would place the WGT2 on the same stage as the Tin Hi-Fi T2. Your experience will vary depending on ear tips, insertion depth, and music. WG provides a frequency response graph, but not a clear idea of what the T2 should sound like. The graph might suggest a U-shaped signature, but that's not the case. Funny enough, some of these statements in WG's marketing appear closer to the mark than their FR graph. The T2 seems to have fairly neutral sub-bass with a slightly emphasized mid-bass. There is good clarity in the bass region and slightly faster than normal transients when considering dynamic drivers in general. There is little bass bleed into the mids. The mids are forward. Vocals stand one to two steps ahead of instruments. Male and female artists receive a slight emphasis in their sibilance if that detail is recorded into the track. There is good separation among all mid-centric elements and above average clarity. The treble seems to be close to neutral until the upper treble area. At that point, there is a marginal emphasis. The T2 never sounded harsh or piercing even at high volumes. The T2 has good clarity and detail retrieval and has now taken the spot as the IEM with the greatest amount of detail in my specific detail test. The T2 has wide soundstage, similar to that of the Tin Hi-Fi T2. This is strange. The WG product has some similarities to the Tin Hi-Fi T2. Both present above average detail, clarity, and soundstage, but the Tin Hi-Fi IEM has a bass roll-off and a bit more sibilance and vocal grain emphasis. Vocals sound further away from the ears on the Tin Hi-Fi than they do on the WG. The WG T2 is not a warm-sounding, intimate, Harman Target tuned IEM, but neither is it really an analytical IEM like the Tin Hi-Fi T2. It's an interesting concept. I'm not sure I've ever heard something exactly like the WG T2. My biggest concern with this IEM was the sibilance in treble. I've come to anticipate significant emphases in both aspects because of all the chi fi IEMs I've listened to, but thankfully the WGT2 doesn't seem to go overboard, at least in my opinion. If I had to find a way to explain this sound, I would say that the WGT2 is an amalgam of analytical with balanced. It's a vocal-centric IEM that provides clarity. Only you can decide whether this is something you will end up enjoying. We need to conduct A-B comparisons so that we know where products sit. Sometimes new gear isn't anything sonically new. Here we will compare the WGT2 against the Campfire Audio IO and the Final Audio B2. 
I've already spoken about the Quarks and the Tin Hi-Fi T2 in this video, so hopefully you have some idea how those two IMs generally compare to the WG T2. For this series of tests, I've used these stock accessories. I plugged each IEM into a passive AB switch that was plugged into my RME ADI2 DAC. I listened to my test playlist on Amazon Music HD and Kobus. I tried to volume match. The IO appears to have less sub-bass presentation than the T2. Separation of sub-bass from mid-bass is similar. Transients is a little bit faster on the T2, but not by much. Mid-bass impact is a little harder on the T2. Overall bass clarity is a little bit more noticeable on the T2. The mids are somewhat similar. Both IEMs push vocals forward ahead of instruments, both emphasize sibilance. However, the IO has a bit more sibilance emphasis and makes vocals appear a little bit closer to the ears. Separation of mid-centric elements is more clear on the T2. The IO has an upper treble roll-off. The T2 has a fairly neutral treble and a slight emphasis in the upper treble. Treble instruments are closer to the ears on the IO and there is greater separation on the T2. The T2 has wider soundstage and greater detail retrieval than the IO. On my new light test, the IO rendered 6 footsteps compared to the 9 to 10 I heard on the T2. The B2 has marginally less sub bass emphasis compared to the T2. Transients is a little faster on the T2. Separation of sub bass from mid bass is slightly clearer on the T2. Mid bass impact is very similar, however. There is a pretty big difference between these two IMs in the mids region. Both push vocals forward, but the B2 has noticeably less sibilance than the T2. Vocals are more separated, a little clearer on the T2. The B2 smooths out vocal grain, while the T2 keeps that detail neutral. The treble is also different. The B2 has a treble roll-off, while the T2 has a marginal upper treble emphasis. Clarity in this region is more obvious on the T2. Separation of treble instruments is, again, more apparent on the T2. The T2 has wider soundstage and greater detail retrieval than the B2. In my new light test, the B2 rendered 5 to 6 footsteps. Comparisons like these help us figure out when new products are actually worth considering. Sometimes our current gear replicates what the newer gear purports to do. The WGT2 has a unique presentation, and not everyone will like it. You can say the same thing for the Final Audio B2, Campfire Audio IO, Tin Hi Fi T2, and the Blonde BL03. The best part of the never ending IEM market is that you have all sorts of options. What is the right price for an IEM? I'm sure there are plenty of people who would spend no more than $100 and are quite happy with the gear they currently have. Others like to collect IEMs and don't have an aversion to paying hundreds of dollars for one pair. And of course, there is the uber premium IEM market that caters to those who have lots of money, particularly in the thousand dollar range. I just can't spend one thousand dollars on IEM, I can't fathom doing that. I simply don't see how IEM manufacturers can legitimately explain prices over five hundred dollars. The laws of physics puts a limit on what IEMs can actually do. Their smaller enclosures and directed sound into the ear make it pretty difficult to reach too far beyond what is already done at far lower price points. Shoehorn as many drivers as you want into an IEM, but it won't change the overall limitation. When I look at products like the Aria, Quarks, Ten Hi Fi T2, Eco OH2, and others, I see a variety of IEMs that are affordable, well built, and cater to all sorts of sound preferences. You could happily live in the sub $100 IEM market for the rest of your life if you wanted to. But there are some products above that price bracket which I find unique. The Campfire Audio IO and the Final Audio B2 are two examples. They're both a few hundred dollars, but both offer a type of sound that I cannot seem to replicate lower down the ladder. I think this is where the WGT2 lives as well. The T2 has a unique performance. It is vocal centric, but does not skimp on bass. It is clear, but not particularly harsh. It is detailed, but not analytical or clinical in its approach. It is well built, well accessorized, and well fitting. This brings us to value. For around $250, I think the WGT2 does make a compelling argument for value. There is no guarantee you will like it or that you will appreciate its detail and clarity, but it is indeed different from the competition that I am aware of. To some, 
the WGT2 will have more siblings than they prefer. Others will want more bass. Still others will want a warmer sound signature. Those are personal sound preferences only you can judge. So, yes, I think the WGT2 is arguably value. If you think this is the type of sound you might be interested in, and you don't have an aversion to paying a few hundred dollars for an IEM, then I think the T2 is definitely worth looking into.